Hello. 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 Tell me if you guys can hear me. I apologize for asking that. It's just when I do these, there's a delay that goes from my audio to the screen. So I always have to check so I can fix it if need be. It's not like an immediate feedback. So your, your constructive feedback is always super helpful. So thank you everybody for that. As we begin this Tuesday. Tuesday, what's today? February 21st. Okay. There we have a good morning. Did you guys memorize five words this morning? Who here memorized five words this morning? Five words. So when I say five words, they could be any five words you want, obviously relating to the real estate exam. And what I want you to do is set those words aside in the evening. And then when you wake up, memorize them. If you guys research, the morning is when you do your best work. So if you want to exercise, if you want to spend quality time with your romantic partner, if you want to spend quality time with your kids, if you want to get paperwork done, whatever it is you want to do, the morning is when you're the most physically ready, mentally ready, whatever it may be. Okay. So you got to prioritize the most important thing in the morning. Now being memorized in the words is super important because you have an exam to pass. And also it doesn't take that much time I'm talking about five words, maybe 15 minutes in the morning. You still have time to do the other things, but I'm sure you guys know the morning is when you do the top priority stuff. Like I said, whether it's exercise or quality time with somebody or doing some paperwork or whatever, whatever you deem most important in your life. And I say memorize those five words because at the end of the day, this is a glorified vocabulary test. And if you don't know your vocabulary, all these questions mean nothing. Okay. So everybody promised me right in the chat. I promise I'll memorize five words every morning. And that way, if the day gets away from you, at least you did that. Okay. So everybody promise, please, please do that. I can't say it enough. Please make sure you memorize five words every morning. Okay. Now I'm not saying that's everything, but it is a good baseline. You still need to practice questions, watch some videos, you know, do some research for concepts you don't understand, all that stuff. But it's that consistency. Too many people wait for the weekend before and take these like crash courses. And there's nothing wrong with those crash courses, but those are there for review. Those are there for review. Okay. They're not meant like crash course, learn everything at once. How many of you guys heard, just take a crash course, you'll be fine. You won't be fine. You will not be fine. Just think logically. Could you really sit in a room in a hotel room for a weekend or on a, on a computer and memorize a bunch of real estate law that you heard for the first time? If you do, you should be like applying to be on the X-Men for, for your superpower. Okay. So the crash courses are great. I recommend them highly, but keep in mind, they're a review. They're not there to learn everything. Okay. Has everybody got that? It's a review. It's a review. It's a review. With that being said today, we're going to talk about contracts. By the way, I have a fan on above me. If that noise is bothering you, I could turn it off. It just makes it a little pleasant for me, but I don't need it. Um, so if I need to turn off that fan, just let me know. Okay. So with the contracts, what are the essentials of a valid contract? What are the essentials of a valid contract? Who could tell me? What are the essential elements of a valid contract? What do you guys think? Congratulations to the people who pass and good luck to the people who are about to take it. I see a lot of notes in the chat regarding that. 
Okay, the four essentials of a valid contract are mutual consent, lawful object, consideration, and capable parties. Everybody write that in the chat, all four of those. Everybody write it. Mutual consent, consideration, offer and acceptance, and capable parties. Mutual consent, lawful object, consideration, or capable parties. By the way, another study tip. Somebody asked me about a study tip. I'm sorry if I'm saying a lot of these study tips, but I think they're very helpful. Write stuff down. Write it down, write it down. It doesn't matter with your pen or on a keyboard. In the prep agent control panel, we actually have um, a program, if you guys look, where you can write in the vocabulary words. The reason I say write it in, the reason we put that in the prep agent control panel as an option is because it makes you active in your learning. Does everybody got it? It forces you to do an activity rather than just staring at a piece of paper or a screen and just zoning out. By writing it down, it forces you to stop doing other things, think about what you're doing, and kind of write stuff down. Does everybody got that? Sorry if I jumble my words there a little bit. Okay. So the four essential valid contract are mutual consent, capable parties, lawful object, Okay, what did we say? You said mutual consent, lawful object, capable of parties, and consideration. That was the other one. Just so you guys don't get confused. Mutual consent, offer and acceptance, meeting of the minds, agreement, they all are the same thing. So depending on the textbook you use or the courses you take, you may see it phrased a different way. But please don't get confused if you see one of those way on your exam, all right? Because some of you guys may be like, I memorized mutual consent. What's this offer and acceptance stuff? Okay, it's all the same thing. So don't get thrown off if you see something that you learned phrased in a different way in your exam. And this is a perfect example. Mutual consent, um, offer and acceptance, agreement, meeting of the minds, all the same thing. Everybody got that? Is that a helpful tip? Hopefully that helps you guys. Okay, so with that being said, what is offer and acceptance? When do you have offer and acceptance? When do you have that mutual consent? What do you guys think? When do you have that? Okay, so mutual consent is when you have offer acceptance and you communicate back that acceptance. Okay, because you can't accept something and not tell anybody. So if you make an offer and they accept it and you go off to Costa Rica, they're going to offer it to somebody else. You have to let them know. All right. Good job, everybody. Let's look at the question on the board here. A safety clause is found in a A, lease, B, deposit receipt, C, listing agreement, or D, loan broker statement. And the answer is C, listing agreement. What is a safety clause? Who knows? Who could tell me what a safety clause is? 
What's a safety clause? A safety clause is when you write in the listing agreement saying, if I find a buyer after the listing expires, I don't get paid. But if I find a buyer during the listing and he makes an offer after the listing expires, I get paid. It's also known as a protection period clause. Remember what I said before, guys, about some words are, are have... Has some, excuse me, some things have more than one word for it. Like we were talking about mutual consent, offer acceptance, meeting of the minds. Well, this is another one like that. Protection period clause and safety clause, you may have learned one or the other in your books or your classes, but they mean the same thing. Everybody got it, right? I got it. Safety clause or protection period clause means that you get paid if your buyer closes the deal after the listing expires if you identified them as your buyer before the listing expires. The way this works, you literally hand a note to the seller um, and it lists the people you were working with. And usually it's around two weeks, but like anything else, it's whatever is agreed upon. If you guys didn't know, you could click on the highlighted word in the questions and the definition comes up. How many of you guys didn't know that? How many of you guys didn't know that if you click on the highlighted word, the definition comes up? Okay. Now, a listing is a contract. And we're talking about contracts today. So my question to you guys is, what type of contract is it? Do 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 what type of contract is it? What do you guys think? Desiree says employment contract. Great answer. Lorena says bilateral. Good answer. These are both great answers. So first let's talk about the employment contract. Dana says specific. Also correct. These are all great answers. So employment contract all right, what are you employed to do? Well, first, let me ask you, who is employed? Let's start with that. Who is employed? Who is employed? So when you get a listing, who is the employer and who's the employee? Who is the employer and who is the employee? So the employer is the seller. The employee is the broker not the agent. Okay. In most states of which you guys are in, there's a broker and there's an agent. The broker is the responsible party and the agent works under that broker. Okay. But on the dotted line goes the broker. Now, if you're in a state that doesn't use that terminology, you still have the same relationship. Some call it principal broker and then broker. There's different terms for it sometimes, but every state has that relationship of one head responsible party, and then they hire people under them who work under their contracts. Okay. Everybody got that? So, Every state has that relationship. Most call it broker agent, but if they don't, they still have that same deal where maybe principal broker and associate broker or things of that nature. Okay. So you have the brokers employed by the seller and what is the broker employed to do? Now, obviously the broker is not doing this all the time. Their agent that is working under them is doing this. Then they share the commission as per they agree upon. But what are they being employed to do? Find a buyer. That's right, Liviette. The broker is the employee and the seller is the employer. And it's an independent contractor relationship. So when you guys sign up with a brokerage, whether it's Remax, Cole Banker, Keller Williams, or some independent one in your area, whichever one it may be, they're not your employer. 
they're more like your business partner. You have an agreement with them. Okay. The seller is the employer. Now I know in practical senses, it's more like they're your employer, but we're not talking practical. We're talking about the technical way the, the contracts are written. So you could pass your exam. Okay. So they're hired to find a buyer, not sell the house. Why are you not hired to sell the house? So people always say, why is there a listing to sell the house? That's not correct. How many of you guys hear agents say, yeah, I'll sell your house, sign a listing with me. That is not correct. The correct way to say it is if you list your property with me, I'll find a buyer. I'll find a buyer. Okay. Why do they have to say it like that? Because it's not their house to sell. You could bring a buyer, but at the end of the day, the seller has to sign on the dotted line saying deal done offer acceptance. Let's communicate back the acceptance and let's move on with our lives. Okay. Now, if you bring a qualified buyer after doing all the due diligence and open houses and marketing and all that other stuff, and they don't sell, there may be legal ramifications depending on the contract because you did what you promised to do, which is find a buyer. But still, even with that being said, they have to make the decision to sell the house, not you. Everybody got it, right? Got it. And that's an important distinction. Okay. So technically you've earned your commission when you found a qualified buyer. Now, obviously enforcing that without the selling the house, a lot of drama, but leave that for another day. The other word I saw, and I hope you guys don't mind. I'm doing a lot of teaching today rather than just doing the questions. I hope you don't mind I'm trying to shake it up. Sometimes I do more questions, just list the questions, read the answer. But today I thought it'd be helpful to do a little more explaining and teaching, um, to get a good concept of everything. And if it doesn't work for you, don't worry. We have multiple teachers who do things different ways. And even myself next week, I'll probably do this a different way. So if this style doesn't work for you that I'm doing today, then don't worry. We have many webinars and I'll be back doing things in a different way another day. Okay. So I was talking about that seller is the one that sell the house, not the agent. I also saw you guys bring up the word bilateral contract. What is bilateral? What does it mean? What does bilateral mean? What do you guys think bilateral means? Lorena said it very well. So did Martha, a promise for a promise. So that's what bilateral is. What's the definition of a unilateral contract? So bilateral is a promise for a promise. What's the definition of a unilateral contract? Unilateral is a promise for an act. Good job. I want everybody to write that down. I feel like a lot of you guys know what it is. Like, you know, you're like, okay, there's only one thing done, but the technical definition, I want everybody to write this down because I know you guys have a good idea what it is, but as it's written in the law books, it's promise for a promise and promise for an act. Bilateral is promise for a promise. Unilateral is promise for an act. Everybody write that down because sometimes I want you guys to know the exact definition as it looks, because that could be helpful on your real estate exam. So you don't get confused if it's like, well, then nah, 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 nah. I want you to know exactly how it looks because we don't want these easy concepts to become more difficult because we have a idea what it is, but not exactly what it is. Okay. So bilateral is promise for a promise. Unilateral is promise for an act. The reason I bring this up is you guys mentioned a listing is a promise for a promise. Is that always true? Is that always true? Is a listing always a promise for a promise? Is a listing always a promise for a promise? No. So you gotta be careful. Be careful whenever you see in your exam absolutes. 
And when I say absolutes, what I'm referring to is words like always, never. They're not good to use when you argue with your friends and your spouse or your family. And they're not good on your exam. Okay? You never like it when you argue with your loved ones and they say, you always do that. You never say the blah, blah. And you're like, well, it's not like always. Same thing applies to your exam. Okay? Because in law, usually there's an exception to almost every rule. Everybody got that? So my tip, my exam tip for the day, and write this down, is be very careful of absolutes. And what I mean by absolutes are words like always, never. You prefer words like sometimes and usually. Okay? Is that always the case? No, but you get the idea. Okay, is that a good tip? Everybody write good tip if that's a good tip. It should be one of those things that pop out on you when you're taking your exam. So what's the exception with a listing? Well, an exclusive listing, when you hire one agent, it's exclusive, that's bilateral. See, you can't hire anybody else, so they got to do their job. They are committing to actively look for a buyer either through open houses, advertising, whatever it may be. If they're not doing anything, they could be in violation of the contract. If you have an exclusive listing, you sign it and you go take a trip to Panama or something like that, you could be in violation of that contract. It's not just bad business. It could be, as I said, a contractual violation. But an open listing the agent is not committed to finding a buyer because the seller has a right to hire many other agents. Life with Monty says, how would I know not to get confused with always and never? It will literally say always and never on the uh, questions. Ooh, all capitals. Get so nervous when people write all capitals. Anybody have friends who text you in all capitals and you're like, woo, okay, relax, I'm here, I got you. Okay, so. Always and never. Now I lost train of my thought. Where was I? Where did I leave off there? Unilateral, bilateral, contracts. Ah, all right. Open listings. Thank you, Joseph Tamis. Open listings. Thank you. So open listings mean you can hire anybody you want. Okay. So there's no commitment because if I hire you and you're not looking for an agent in an open listing, no problem. I'll go hire 10 others. But in exclusive listing, if you don't look for a buyer, I'm in trouble. That's a problem for me. Therefore, and everybody write this down, exclusive listings need a definite termination date. Everybody got that? Because of what I just said, exclusive listings need a definite termination date. You guys got that? I'll say it again. Exclusive listings need a definite termination date. Because if the agent isn't good at what they do, there has to be a time where you could go and look for another agent to help you find that buyer. So therefore, open listings do not need a definition termination date because of what we said. You could look for another broker to help you at any time. Everybody got that? Say, I got it. Okay, so let's look at how this would look in question form. What we said, I assume everybody's gonna get this right, hopefully. But we just want to look at what I explained in the form of a question that you might see. So a listing agreement is essentially an A, option to sell, B, purchase contract, C, unilateral contract, or D, employment contract. And like we discussed, it would be an employment contract. 
And notice the definition, a listing is most often bilateral. That is not always. And here it says here, open listings are considered unilateral. Do you see that wording there? I want everybody to take notes. Somebody asked me how it looks with the always and never. Well, this definition is a great example. A listing is most often bilateral, but not always. Right, guys? And here it says open listings are considered unilateral. Everybody see that? Bye, Shazia. Have a good day. Okay. A valid listing. Okay, to be valid, an exclusive listing must contain all the following except A, description of the property, B, signatures of all the interested parties, C, an expiration date, or D, the final contract price. The answer is the final contract price. Be careful of this word. Everybody see that word? Except. Be careful of that, guys. Except, gotta look for that. So you may be wondering which one, the most obvious, the best answer, and go for the best answer is more than often, two may seem correct. So you gotta go with the best answer. And the obvious one to me is final contract price because the final contract price is what a buyer offers on the property and everybody agrees upon. When you get a listing, you have, don't even have a buyer yet. So that can't be there. Everybody got that? Okay. The buyer of a home was not informed the house was on a septic tank system. And she didn't discover this fact until the system backed up a few days before she took possession. The buyer typically has the right to A, sue the title company for failure to discover the problem, B, remain silent, C, rescind the contract, or D, sue the broker for his license. And the answer is C. Licensee sellers must reveal material facts. What is a material fact? You guys ever heard that before? What's a material fact? What's a material fact? So a material fact is something that's easily seen by somebody who's not a professional, okay? Very often, licensees think they could do everything. You see real estate licensees give legal advice, give inspection advice, give construction advice, when really, they can't do none of those. Really, what they do is allocate to others. They go above and beyond, which they always shouldn't do. You got to stay in your lane, right, guys? And let me give you an example. When you go in a house and the door does not shut properly, what are you supposed to do? You give the material fact, as it says on the board, that the door is not shutting properly, period. Now, you may know that very often, as you guys practice real estate, the door is not shutting properly it's because there's foundation issues. But can you tell the seller that there's foundation problems? No. That's for the inspector to do whatever licensed professional is licensed to do that. So you may kind of nudge the inspector or somebody else or the construction guy like, hey, door's not shutting properly. Look up, say, down, say, hey, hey, you know, give them whatever hints you want. But at the end of the day, all you could say is the door's not shutting properly. And I give that example because that's a material fact. Now, just so you guys know, very often doors don't shut properly because the foundation issues because the house shifted a little bit, either on top or bottom. When the house shifts a little bit because of foundation issues, that's when it becomes hard to shut the door. 
Some of you guys know that, some of you guys will learn that, but that's very often a symptom of foundation issues when the door won't shut correctly, when it becomes a little off or skewed. So material facts are things that you see, like you see leaky roof or, or hole in the wall. Those are stuff you are supposed to disclose. In which of the following situations could a broker receive no commission? A, the broker proves that he is the procuring cause of the buyer and exclusive right to sell listing. B, the broker proves that he is the procuring cause of the buyer in a net listing. C, the broker proves that he is the procuring cause of the buyer in an exclusive agency listing. Or D, the broker proves that he is the procuring cause of the buyer in an open listing. And the answer is B. A net listing is illegal in many states, frowned upon the ones are illegal, for this reason we're going to discuss. But either way, you do not need to write if it's illegal or illegal in your state, but you still got to know what it is. It doesn't matter if it's illegal or illegal in your state, you still have to know the definition. People get very caught up with, not legal in my state, still got to know it though. So why is it illegal in many states? What's wrong with it? And why is it frowned upon in the states it is legal? So what's the big issue with a net listing? Why do many states say it's not allowed at all? And why do some states, you could do it, but I don't like it. What's the problem with a net listing? The problem with the net listing is a net listing says if you sell a house for 500 grand and you get 550, a buyer bringing 550, you made 50 grand. The problem is if that buyer brings an offer for 500 grand, because then you get nothing. And now there's a conflict of interest because you would have done all that work and you could get absolutely nothing, as it indicates in the question here. Okay? You could do all that work and get absolutely nothing. But you still have to present the offer because you have your fiduciary responsibility to the seller. And there goes the conflict. And many states say, we're not going to leave it up to agents to do the right thing. Because many agents, if they put all that work, they're going to magically not present that offer. Even though they're supposed to. Because they know they'll get nothing. So therefore, we're just going to make it not allowed. Because we don't have enough faith in the agents to do the right thing and present an offer that will bring them zero commission. And that's a possibility in net listing. So the net listing means you get paid an amount above and beyond a designated price. Everybody got that? Do I think the state portion is easy? I don't know. Each state's different. Which type of listing do you not have to prove that you're the procuring cause of the buyer? In which type of listing do you not have to prove that you're the procuring cause of the buyer? Exclusive right to sell. Exclusive right to sell. An exclusive agency, you have to prove it because the seller sells themselves, you get nothing. Exclusive right to sell you don't have to prove it because you get paid no matter what. And that's the most typical listing you'll see. In an open listing, you obviously have to prove it because you have to prove you found the buyer and not the other brokers. All right. Well, I hope that was helpful today, guys. I did a lot of talking today, but I hope it was valuable. I will be back next Tuesday. For the rest of the week, we got... Um, Stu, Maria, and Candice doing some great webinars. And like I said, they all have different styles, different ways of teaching. So if you don't like one, don't worry. Wait till the next day, you'll get somebody different. And obviously, all of these are in replay via your control panel. So thanks, everybody. Have an amazing day. I'll see you next week.